let's get started. Uh, so today we're going to sort of continue talking about these uh, generalized Penrose processes, these ways of extracting energy from rotating black holes, uh, but focus on some particular cases, uh, and mainly one called the uh, super radiance, which is sort of the wave version of the story of extracting energy from uh, rotating black holes. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, super radiance and some situations in which super radiance might actually give rise to an instability. And then uh, for sort of the last half of the class, uh, I'm actually going to just show you some uh, sort of very brief highlights from some sort of research applications of super radiance and these uh, related ideas from uh, you know, various researchers at PI. Uh, and this will also sort of uh, be a nice segue into next week. So all the stuff I'm going to present are sort of from uh, performing uh, nonlinear evolutions of the GR equations. So, you know, sort of in this class so far, we've been just thinking about Einstein's equations as, a, you know, some uh, condition on the geometry of our four-dimensional space-time manifolds. But starting next week, we're going to sort of think of it more as uh, some sort of evolution equations that allow us to, you know, start with uh, some geometry and then evolve forward to find some geometry at some later time. Yeah. So uh, yesterday we talked about these generalized Penrose processes. And we showed, uh, in particular, that uh, if we look at any sort of stress energy tensor and calculate the uh, flux across the black hole horizon, if it satisfies this null energy condition, uh, we should get something like this relation for the amount of energy with respect to this killing vector across the occur black hole horizon and the amount of angular momentum, which is exactly the uh, conditions such that the black holes horizon, sorry, the black holes, the area of the black holes horizon will actually increase. Yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, super radiance. So uh, this is sort of the wave version of the Penrose process. Uh, so to uh, look at super radiance, let's first consider the simplest kind of uh, wave we can have, which is just the scalar field. So just a massless scalar field. Uh, so it satisfies the massless klein gordon equation. And that's just that box of psi, which is just two covariant derivatives contracted with each other, is equal to 0. So of course, in flat space sign, this would be the ordinary wave operator. But now we want to consider this. Yeah? Something I have to extend to the Burroughs process is I was thinking about the Hawking back and standard operation process. Is it, does it go against the area law? because it's a quantum process or still satisfied? Because by the evaporation process, you decrease the mass of the black hole, so uh, think about the speed for a second. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so in some sense, yeah, if we want to go to sort of a generalized, yeah, uh, yeah so if we, so basically we should, if we want to sort of go into thinking about uh, black holes in the way Hawking was, uh, we should just think of not the area law, but just the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, and classically, nothing's going to escape from the black hole, so its entropy is always going to increase. But if it can emit some sort of radiation or some, something like that, then uh, then we have to take into account the entropy in, in both of those together. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But that's going a little bit beyond the purview of this class. So, so all those the black hole laws of thermodynamics, so they're sort of uh, were what people were using to sort of start to think about, you know, classical, or sorry, quantum effects of black holes and so on. 
the, the ones as I presented them, they're just sort of uh, things you can derive from classical GR without, without adding quantum effects. Thanks. Yeah, so the equation of motion for the wave is just a uh, box of psi equals zero and its stress energy tensor is given by this. Uh, so basically what we want to do is uh, imagine we have some solution of the following form. Basically imagine we can separate our solution uh, so into a part that just depends on the radius uh, and theta coordinate and then Basically, imagine we have a wave of some pure frequency omega, and then m is the so-called azimuthal number. Which de determines sort of the axial symmetry. And here I just mean the real part, so just the cosine. Yeah, so basically, what we want to do is uh, plug in these expressions into the equation we had before for the flux of energy across a black hole horizon. So some integral over time, and then we're valuing at the horizon, and then we contract our stress energy tensor uh, with this a uh, normal vector to the horizon and with uh, our time killing vector which basically gives us the conserved current associated with this wave we can kind of think of it as a particle number like a flux of particles. And so just integrate this over the surface of the black hole horizon at some time. Yeah so let's Plug in this expression here. And so this term uh, actually vanishes. Uh, so if you'll recall, for example, like there's many ways to see this, but uh, for example, you know, we wrote well, this is the definition of this vector chi. So uh, for example, we can write this as where this is zero and then we exactly uh, define this uh, quantity at the horizon velocity by contracting with here and then it go to zero. So this guy is zero and so we just have this term right here and then we can use this, this ansatz here to evaluate it.
So we basically, uh, from this time component contracted here, we get a frequency, and then from this part, we get uh, uh, minus m times omega h. Actually, let me. Okay, so just contracting here and here, and then uh, using that expression to evaluate this. So we can note that this part is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. Uh, so basically, the condition on whether or not the flux of the Killian energy into the black hole horizon is positive or negative is just depends on the sign of this thing. Uh, so in particular, uh, you know, if we just take the convention that our frequency is positive, we can write it like this. So when we have, when this condition is true, then we have uh, a negative flux of energy into the black hole. Uh, so this is called the super radiance condition. So you can see that, you know, generically you think of if you have some wave with some frequency, you send it in towards a black hole. Uh, you know, some of it will get absorbed by the black hole, and some will get scattered. Uh, but if you, if you have a spinning black hole and a wave with this, this, in this frequency range, then it could actually be so-called super radiately scattered. It can actually uh, be reflected with more energy than the incoming wave. And we could have probably guessed this immediately uh, just from using that, the first expression I wrote down for a generalized Penrose process. If we you know, just remember that basically uh, if we have some wave packet, the ratio of energy and angular momentum carried by that uh, is just given by this ratio of the frequency to the azimuth number. So this, con this condition is the same as the, the first one I wrote down over there with this identification. <clears throat> so you can see uh, from here, this sort of the super radiance turns off in, in two limits. You know, one is as the frequency approaches this sort of horizon frequency of the black hole uh, times the azimuth number n, and then also turn it also will go to zero as omega goes to zero. Uh, and you can think of that limit as the limit where basically the wavelength of our wave is very long compared to the size of our uh, black hole horizon. So basically, the wave just sort of doesn't feel the black hole. And it's just scattered without sort of being, without much flux across the horizon. So we just derived it here for the scalar case, uh, but it's actually uh, quite a general phenomenon. So it can occur for electromagnetic waves, and it can even occur for gravitational waves. So th this whole analysis, you know, we relied on having a stress energy tensor, so it isn't. Uh, technically applicable to the gravitational wave case, uh, but you can you know sort of construct a uh, gauge dependent sort of effective stress energy tensor for gravitational waves and carry out uh, an analysis sort of like this, or you can just solve the uh, linear perturbation equations on uh, Kerr spacetime uh, and so not surprisingly, uh, if you look at super radiance as a function of spin, it's sort of maximized for 
uh, maximally spinning black holes. Uh, but it also turns out the sort of maximum app amplification you could get, that is, you know, if you send a wave with some energy E, then you get back energy E, uh, you get back energy E times one plus some amplification factor. That actually depends on the spin of the, the wave. Uh, <clears throat> so, so for the scalar case, that's a uh, you know, spin zero. Actually, turns out the max amplification is pretty small. It's about uh, 0.3%. Uh, well, for spin one, that's electromagnetic waves. You can go up to 4.4%. And then for gravitational waves, it's uh, 138%. So this is the, the maximum which occurs for maxly spinning. Uh, and yeah, so. To actually derive these, you need to sort of solve uh, what are called the uh, Tikolsky equations. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about those in week three, but those are basically uh, governed Tuss fields or linear perturbations to the metric on a curved space time. Uh, and it actually turns out uh, that in general, you, the equations do separate uh, into this nice form, and you can actually separate the radial and theta components as well. Uh, but yeah, so to actually determine those radial and, and theta dependence uh, and therefore calculate you know, things like this, you have to, to solve those equations. Is there any difference in the maximum amplification for if you have, a, for example, a massive scalar or a massive uh, electromagnetic-like field? I mean, will that? Uh, yeah, well, so the, the difference is not so much on the, on the amplification. Uh, implication. So that they go back and move. <clears throat> yeah, so what we'll talk about the, the difference is, is mainly that they can form bound states or not. Uh, but yeah, but you can, yeah. So these amplifications are basically you take some wave, you send it in, and then it's going to reflect back out and go back out to infinity. Yeah, so we'll talk about what happens when you have massive bosons. Yeah, so that's sort of brings me to the next point. So. <clears throat> yeah, as we just just mentioned, uh, you know, for all these cases, for you know, photons or gravitational waves or uh, massless scalars, uh, you can super really scatter them, maybe get some energy out of a black hole, uh, but you're not going to get sort of any instability or things like that. And in reality, it'd be very hard to astrophysically arrange to have some wave that sort of you know starts off in some shell or something and is incident upon a black hole and then gets reflected back or something like that. Uh, but uh, so one idea for sort of making this into an instability is to take your black hole and surround it by a mirror. So if you had a, a mirror, then you know you could send in some weight with the right superradiant frequency, and you get reflected back with some amplification, then you can reflect to again, again be super radiantly scattered. And since you know each time you get an amplification that's proportional to the amount of energy this wave is bringing in, this would actually give you uh, an exponential instability. Uh, so this is what this idea was actually due to uh, Preston Tikolsky. And they call this a uh, black hole bomb. Uh, you know, we don't know of any big mirrors we can put around black holes. So, you know, just, just as stated, this doesn't seem like a, a very realistic idea. But uh, <clears throat> there are a couple ways you might get something like a mirror. Uh, so the first one is to consider uh, anti desitter space. So, uh, you know, 
we don't think we live in anti dissider space, uh, but this is something people are interested in, for example, in the ADS CFT correspondence or things like that. And the interesting thing about uh, anti dissider space is that uh, you have a time like boundary. So if you have a, this is sort of the exterior of uh, anti dissider space where sort of infinity corresponds to a time like boundary, and then you would have your black hole horizon here, and you have to impose some boundary conditions, but sort of the most natural ones are essentially uh, like reflecting boundary conditions. So that you uh, uh, sort of keep a constant amount of energy in your space time. And in that case, uh, you, know, you can have waves that would sort of bounce back and forth. And in fact, uh, it turns out that uh, you can get a super radiant instability in anti dissider space this way. But in fact, uh, black holes with ergo regions in anti dissider space are generically unstable. Yeah. And uh, you can get a similar story. Uh, so, so far, I've just been talking about rotating black holes, but you can also have charged black holes. Uh, and then again, there'll be a difference between uh, sort of their total mass and their irreducible mass, uh, which would, would you calculate from their area due to the, basically the energy that's stored in their you know, electromagnetic fields. So again, it's possible if you have a charged particle to extract that energy. Uh, and so you can sort of <coughs> define a gen you know, generalized ergo region for uh, charged black holes. So if you have some particle, then basically the killing energy, uh, you know, again, you get by contracting your killing vector with uh, four momentum. Uh, but in addition to the part just due to the four velocity times the mass, uh, there'll also be a part uh, due to the charge if the particle is charged. And that'll just be given by the killing vector contracted with the uh, vector four potential uh, associated with the black hole. So if you can basically arrange for this to be negative, we can define an effective ergosphere for that particular charge. And then you basically get a, a very similar story. Yeah, and so you know, uh, the story about uh, ADS space times or charged black holes is sort of more uh, for this ADS CFT correspondence or sort of more uh, theoretical application. So probably the most uh, astrophysically relevant uh, version of this, this Penrose uh, process story is the Blanford's and Knight process. So I, I mentioned that briefly yesterday. But the idea is basically that you have a black hole, uh, and away from the black hole, you have some accretion disk where you have uh, basically uh, baryons that can source some magnetic field and basically hold magnetic field lines in the vicinity of the black hole. And if we sort of zoom in close to the black hole, we can you know, this, think of this dipole configuration as mainly giving uh, approximately straight field lines. <coughs> but basically, the black hole's rotation will call these field lines to uh, rotate and therefore give you a pointy flux of energy 
uh, that will carry a rotational energy from the black hole, and we think this is what uh, powers jets. Yeah, so uh, I'm being very sort of sketchy with all these examples, but we'll, this is just to sort of uh, introduce the concepts, and then I'll show you some sort of briefly some research results from all these different things. OK, so uh, we just talked about super radiance for uh, massless bosons. Uh, but uh, Rira was asking about the case of where you have uh, a massive boson. So, and how does that change things? So let's consider a, a massive scalar field. So again, we get the Klein-Gordon equation. But here we have this extra term, which I'll call mu squared, but which is basically just the uh, mass of the boson up to some factor of h bar. It's sort of in the units relativists like to use uh, the scalar field is actually dimensionless. And then we just have you know units of one over length squared here, and mu corresponds to a unit of one over length. So uh, just to make things simple, let's concentrate on the sort of non-relativistic limit, where basically assume the sort of Compton wavelength, uh, sort of effective Compton wavelength of our scalar field, which is just given by one over mu, uh, is much bigger than the size of the black hole we're considering. Uh, and also that our field is basically uh, far away from the black hole. So basically, so we're considering sort of the non-relativistic limit. <clears throat> so if we just write out this equation, So this is just two covariant derivatives contracted with each other. And the first one is just ordinary derivative because it's acting on a scalar. And then we can use this handy uh, identity that basically we can exchange this for an ordinary derivative with these uh, factors of the square root of the negative determinant of the metric. Uh, so in particular, since we're far away from the black hole, uh, for this analysis, we can just ignore the spin of the black hole. And you know, when you're far away from the black hole, you just feel its mass, and the spin falls off uh, more rapidly. So. Metric determinant is just given by this term, and <coughs> you can simplify this as the following. Schwarzschild, this inverse metric GTT component is approximately given by this. And you know, generically, I would have had other terms that were uh, this Laplacian multiplied by like m over r or something like that. But I'm basically assuming that uh, this this uh, Scalar field is in is non-relativistic, so basically, uh, its momentum is much less than its frequency, and so basically, I just need to keep the uh, 
you know, leading order corrections due to the gravitational potential for the, the time components. So if we use the following onsets, Basically, again, just plug in uh, solution at some fixed frequency. Uh, and note that, again, because we're considering non-relativistic limit, uh, this frequency is going to be approximately uh, just given by sort of the mass of the particle with some small non-relativistic correction. So if we plug this in, we get. the following and just collecting some terms. Use this approximation basically to say that we have one of these <coughs> omega minus mu's and set it to be uh, So just took this uh, omega plus mu is approximately uh, a two mu, uh, and then divided it by uh, the other side. And so at the end, we get something given by this. And this equation probably looks familiar from other classes, right? So this is really just the. Uh, Schrodinger equation, time independent Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom, right? Uh, we just have to make some identification. So basically, here our fine structure constant is going to be uh, this term right here, mu times the mass of the black hole. And you know, our energy is, is given by this term. You know, sort of our effective Bohr radius. It's just uh, given by that. <coughs> and you know, no, we didn't actually use any quantum mechanics. We're just starting from the classical wave equation and making this non-relativistic limit. Uh, but you know, since we've all spent so much time solving this equation, we can sort of know immediately that you know, we can get this uh, whole set of sort of uh, bound uh, states that we can you know, label by some uh, quote unquote quantum numbers given by n, which counts the number of radial nodes, uh, radial nodes in our solution, some L and M uh, angular quantum numbers that basically just determine the theta and phi dependence uh, of our solution. And so the 
Yeah, so the point is, you know, for example, if we look at an L equals M equals 1, we know that we're going to get some solution that sort of you know, falls off exponentially uh, with distance. And there'll be some sort of spherical harmonic type term. And then it'll oscillate with some frequency. And this, this mu here. Uh, you know, will be a complex number in general. It will be the real part will be the magnitude. Of the real part will be much greater than the imaginary part. And it'll be approximately mu. And then there'll be basically some cor correction, uh, which will because this particle is slightly uh, bound to our black hole. So it has a uh, sort of negative potential energy. And, but it'll also have some imaginary part. And that's just due to the fact that you know, we actually we sort of zoomed out, but we have to remember that we have a black hole horizon uh, at the middle. So there will actually be some flux of energy across the black hole horizon. And you know, if this, the frequency of, the, of our bound state is less than m times uh, like h, uh, then we can, again, have super radiance. But instead of just having you know, a wave that uh, is scattered by the black hole, we can have these bound states that just sit around the black hole and continuously interact and grow through super radiance. So we can actually get uh, exponentially growing mode. Yeah, so for this, uh, this growth rate, this, this uh, instability to be significant, we don't want uh, alpha to be very, very small. Uh, or equivalently, we sort of want uh, omega to be uh, somewhat comparable to uh, uh, omega h, the rise in frequency of the black hole. Yeah, so basically, this super radiant instability will be so if we just sort of restore uh, units to all this, we can rewrite this alpha as something like this. So this is the, the mass of our boson. So you can see that when it's we have a black hole that's sort of stellar mass, you know, 10 to those 10 solar masses or so, uh, then we want the mass of this boson to be uh, s somewhere in the range of 10 to the minus 12 electron volts. So these are very ultralight bosons that would be relevant uh, for having a super radiant stability around uh, you know, astrophysical black holes. Uh, and of, of course, we don't know of any such ultralight bosons in the standard model. Uh, they're all much more massive. Uh, but particle physicists uh, have speculated about a, a number of such candidates and extensions to the standard model, things like the axion or dark photons or, some, or uh, things like that, where you would actually have these very ultralight bosons. And they may be very weakly coupled to standard model, standard model particles, which is why we don't find them in colliders or things like that. They may be some sort of dark matter. Uh, but the super radiant stability actually doesn't rely on any sort of coupling to ordinary matter. All we're relying on is that they gravitate, just like we think all other matter does. And you can get a similar story uh, uh, for vector bosons as well as uh, scalar bosons. Uh, and the fact that instability rates are higher, uh, you know, related to the fact that, uh, I guess it's underneath this board, the fact that you know, if you just look at the scattering case, the amplification factor is uh, larger for vectors as opposed to scalars. So, uh, any questions about that? Is there any like because at some point we uh, lower the uh, projector? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I was talking to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we, can we lower the projector now? Thanks. Uh, when, when does like the back reaction start being important into this, and could that like somehow like stop the instability? Yeah. So actually, that's, huh. that's exactly what we're going to talk about here. Uh, so very good question. Uh, you know, whenever we have an instability, we want to ask, you know, once this thing grows large enough, what's gonna what's gonna be the nonlinear behavior? What's gonna cause it to saturate? Uh, any other questions before we go into this? Yeah, so just in the last uh, 15 or 20 minutes, just want to briefly talk about some of the, <clears throat> some results from the nonlinear regime of superradiance. Uh, so this is researched by various friends at, at PI. Uh, so first of all, uh, just as a warm up, we talked about this Blanford's and I process uh, for powering jets. Uh, so just to give you a more concrete example of this, this is a particular uh, realization of this Blanford's and Ive process in the case where you just have uh, a uniform magnetic field and then a spinning black hole. It's immersed in this uh, uniform magnetic field. This is something Romero knows a whole lot about. Uh, yeah, so the magnetic field lines you get. So you actually you find a, a stationary solution once you allow this to relax. And you have field, magnetic field lines. Uh, far away, they're just straight. And then close by, they, they thread the black hole. You, can get, you see you get some electric field here. And if you measure basically uh, the rotational velocity of these field lines, which uh, you can define in a particular way, this axisymmetric space time, uh, you get uh, this, you, uh, and you plot them basically as a function of flux, you get the curves like this. So this is basically just telling you as we look at these different field lines uh, in, in our jet solution, how fast are they rotating? Uh, and you can see we've normalized by the rise in frequency of the black hole. Uh, and th these cases just correspond to different spins of the black hole. You can see basically they're all uh, right below this uh, bound that we wrote down uh, that allows you to extract energy from the black hole. So basically the black hole is causing these field lines to rotate. And if you, you know, measure the pointy flux, the, ener the energy radiated by this electromagnetic field far away, uh, you get the positive energy. And this plot just shows that, again, as you increase the spin of the black hole, the amount of energy you can extract uh, increases. Uh, and here, this is showing basically two different ways of calculating, or two different uh, energy densities within the vicinity of the black hole. And this dotted red line corresponds to the ergo region. Uh, so you know, you'll recall that the energy density seen by some observer, to calculate that, we just take the stress energy tensor and contract it with the uh, forward velocity of our observer. So this first one is just this quantity, and where we take this, uh, the, our observer to be the one that's uh, basically perpendicular to our slices of constant time. Uh, but that's not actually the one that's conserved, right? So the one, so the conserved current, you remember, is given by contracting uh, this with a time-like killing vector, and then so the conserves. So then you can also calculate uh, the sort of conserved energy that uh, observer that, is, that again uh, perpendicular to. Uh, slices of constant time observes. And then we get something like this. We can see that, in fact, it's going negative uh, because we're in the ergo region. So our uh, time killing vector is actually becoming space like. So that's the uh, plan for the process. So here is uh, just super radiance. 
supergiant scattering of a gravitational wave. So we have a spinning black hole here at the middle, and then we're going to have an incoming wave uh, blue, and it's going to be scattered and create this outgoing gravitational wave and red. And you can see it's actually a very strong gravitational wave. It has something like 10% of the mass of the black hole. So it distorts the horizon, and it creates this outgoing wave. And this is actually uh, you know, a full nonlinear solution to the TR equations. What is it, the remaining stuff there? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a little bit hard to define exactly what you mean by a gravitational wave in the vicinity of the black hole. So as a proxy for this, we're using uh, something that we'll probably discuss in week three. It's called this uh, newman penrose scalar psi-4. So uh, that encodes a gravitational wave sort of far away near the black hole. It's less clear what that means. Mm -hmm. So those, okay. are, those are just the contours of that. Yeah. Yeah, so you can uh, see that you extracted energy from the rotating black hole by you know, comparing the amount of energy in the incoming wave to that of the outgoing wave. Uh, but you can also look at the properties of the black hole before and after. So we haven't really talked about how to define uh, black holes in a dynamical setting. We'll get, that, we'll get to that next week. Uh, but uh, you, can use, you can do that using something called an apparent horizon. And if you basically look at the properties of that, you can first just look at its area and calculate an irreducible mass. Uh, and so this is comparing the irreducible mass sort of before and after uh, for three different cases, where basically uh, the blue case, the frequency is above the super radiant uh, cutoff. Uh, the red case is where it's uh, very near to being exactly at the threshold for super radiance. And then the black curve is where it's below the super radiant bound, so we can actually extract energy. Uh, and so you can see that in all three cases, uh, the area of our black hole is greater afterwards than before. Uh, however, if we look at the mass of the black hole or the angular momentum, we can see that uh, for the case corresponding to the black crosses, the angular momentum and mass actually go down compared to the other two cases where this gravitational wave is uh, mostly absorbed by the black hole. And uh, you can actually, you know, see how the linear prediction uh, begins to break down a little bit in the nonlinear regime. So this is basically showing you, as a function of the amount of energy that you're extracting from the black hole, what is sort of the efficiency of the process. That is, uh, how much energy are you extracting from the black hole compared to how much rotational energy you're losing from the black hole. So basically when this black hole uh, undergoes this interaction, uh, if you're in the super regime, you'll extract some rotational energy. But the black hole area will also increase. So the irreducible mass will also increase. So that's energy that you can no longer get out. So it's sort of been lost. So you can see that in the nonlinear regime, at least for this particular case, the efficiency, uh, nonlinear effects that cause the efficiency to be somewhat uh, suppressed. And it's not that surprising if you think about it because I uh, can, you know, have this big wave that's actually changing the properties of the black hole, it's spinning it down somewhat as it's interacting with the wave. So it's somewhat, you can think of the final black hole as going to be less super radiantly efficient uh, than the initial black hole. And so during this process, uh, you expect the same thing to happen. Uh, you can also think of it as kind of like analogous to, uh, you know, like the, the fact that, uh, you know, you have most thermodynamic efficiency when you sort of have, a, you know, quasi-equilibrium uh, <clears throat> process, and then when you have a very dynamical process that's happening very fast, uh, you lose efficiency. Yeah, so now that, that was just regular super radiance. Now, what about the super radiant instability? 
So this is some work that uh, Pablo did along with uh, Louise Lehner and, and Stephen Green. And they were interested in looking at uh, a charged black hole in uh, ABS and looking at the super rate instability of a charged scalar field. So this uh, animation here is going to show you uh, the, this charged scalar field outside the black hole. And you have to notice that the, basically the, uh, <coughs> this, this label here is increasing, indicating that the scale is actually increasing. So initially you start with some arbitrary perturbation, uh, and then it sort of starts to settle down as it, uh, this unstable mode rises up. You can see that this, the magnitude of this charged scalar field outside the black hole is uh, increasing exponentially in time. And then eventually the time is still moving forward, but it's uh, basically remaining the same because the instability is saturated. can see that more easily on these plots here. So the top plot shows the uh, apparent horizon radius as a function of time. So you can see that it's uh, increasing exponentially and then it saturates. Uh, and on these two plots, you can see uh, the black hole charge. So instead of uh, angular momentum, we're extracting charge from the black hole. And that's uh, given by this teal line. So it's decreasing and then it saturates. And that charge is going into the scalar field, which actually forms this uh, sort of hair around the black hole in ADS. Yeah, so finally, let's go on to the case of a massive boson. So like we said, in, uh, massive bosons can actually form these bound states around black holes, even in asymptotically flat settings. Uh, and when they're Compton wavelength is comparable to the size of black hole. Uh, you can actually get these clouds that grow exponentially in time. So here's an animation from a study of a massive vector field uh, around a spinning black hole. So black holes spin points in that direction. And this is the energy density uh, in the massive vector field. And it grows exponentially with time. And then it'll eventually saturate. And you probably can't see it from that plot, but not only is the energy and angular momentum in the cloud growing exponentially in time, but the black hole space time is actually changing as well. So for these two figures, uh, the blue curves tell you the uh, energy and angular momentum in this cloud of vector bosons. And the uh, dotted black curves show you the loss of the black hole's mass and angular momentum as a function of time. Uh, and these are for just different cases with different values of the uh, vector boson mass mu. Uh, and you can see that the black hole is losing quite a lot of mass in some cases, up to you know, almost 10% and up to 35% you know, of its angular momentum. Uh, but it's eventually, at some point, this instability uh, shuts off, and these curves are essentially constant. Uh, and so you know, does anyone know that why that's happening? Yeah, so uh, the reason the instability is shutting off is because as this black hole is losing energy and angular momentum, its horizon frequency, omega h, is actually decreasing. So you can see that in this plot here. Uh, omega h is given by these blue curves. Uh, and the, basically, the frequency of the, these vector bosons is given by the dashed red curves. So you can see that they're decreasing, decreasing uh, as the black hole is spun down. And then they sort of smoothly approach uh, the frequency given by the vector boson cloud. Uh, and so even though we have you know, these huge clouds of you know, something like 10% of the mass of the black hole oscillating very close to the horizon, uh, and we're very much in the nonlinear regime, it's, it, it seems like this is actually 
uh, happens, you know, quasi adiabatically, where just the black hole is going through a series of uh, states that correspond approximately to spinning black curve solutions with uh, different lower values of spin. And then eventually, as these two approach each other, our super radiance condition is saturated and we no longer get instability. Yeah, so these are exciting because when you have these oscillating clouds sitting around with black holes, uh, they will actually produce gravitational waves. Uh, and so basically, uh, the gravitational waves are pretty simple. They're actually a sort of uh, monochromatic. The frequency is uh, more or less constant and is just given by twice the oscillation frequency of this cloud. Uh, and then you'll, the amplitude of it will slowly decrease as the cloud uh, you know, loses energy to gravitational waves. Uh, but so this is something that you know, people at uh, LIGO and other gravitational wave uh, instruments are very much interested in, in looking for. Uh, you can either look for a stochastic background of these gravitational waves coming from you know, a whole ensemble of spinning black holes that are being spun down due to this instability, uh, or you can even do targeted searches. Uh, so for example, uh, you know a very good way to create a spinning black hole is to, two, is to merge two black holes together. So uh, you know, when LIGO sees a black hole merger, it can potentially uh, do a follow-up observation to look for uh, some continuous source of gravitational waves coming from that newborn spinning black hole. And you know, we could use this to uh, look for uh, these uh, new particles. How long would these emissions like last after a merger? Uh, it, so it can vary a lot. Uh, so like for these very relativistic cases, uh, you know, like the one shown here, it can be as short as like uh, hours, but generic, these can be much longer than that. It can be like weeks or months or even longer. But yeah, but basically the the small, you know, the smaller this alpha parameter is that I uh, wrote down, which is basically the, you know, how tells you how far the cloud sits away to, from the black hole and how uh, big the Compton wavelength of the particle is compared to the black hole mass. Like the bigger you make that, the sort of longer it takes for these to grow and the longer it takes for them to, to dissipate. Yep. And yeah, finally, besides uh, looking for gravitation waves, you can also uh, just measure black hole spins. And every time you measure a, uh, a black hole to have a spin of, uh, and you know that it's existed long enough where if you had one of these particles that would have been spun down by this instability, you can basically rule out uh, having a massive boson in that, that given range. So this just illustrates it by saying, let's say we start with an ensemble of black holes that have mass uh, given by the x-axis here, and then spin given by the y-axis there. And then we uh, subject them to uh, a uh, massive boson with a given uh, mass, then that'll cause some range of these to be unstable and to spin down. And then we'll get the, the actual uh, distribution of mass spin will be something like this. We get these different parts carved out. And you can you know, measure spins either from gravitational waves uh, or by uh, using these uh, X-ray observations of accreting black holes or things like that. Yeah, so that's uh, all I wanted to say for today. So are there any questions about that? Or anything else? What are the spins that LIGO has measured for black holes like after the merger? Uh, until now, or they, they're not really high, right? Uh, the, the spin of the final black yeah. hole? Final black hole. Uh, yeah, so you know, when you, if you take two non-spinning black holes and you merge them, they have a spin of about 0.7. Mm. Uh, that's basically just from the, the orbital angular momentum sort of at the last plunge phase when they uh, you know, are very rapidly forming a common horizon. Uh, so I think most black holes at least uh, are you know, to within the range that we can tell uh, the final black hole has that, that spin. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's said another way, we 
except for maybe one case, we haven't been able to rule out that the black holes are non-spinning, the ones that are coming together to merge, so there's no extra angular momentum. And that's the weird part, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so depending on your favorite model for uh, creating uh, black holes, yeah, you may prefer them to ask Ben or, or not. And so, yeah, so it's kind of strange that so far uh, most of them seem to be non spinning. Any other questions? Okay, so I will see you all on Monday.